Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Kimberly Datchik. I'm the Curator of Learning and Engagement at the Stanley Museum of Art. Welcome to our Jean and Richard Levitt lecture, Art as Experience with Nana Okore. Before we get started, um, you'll see on the screen the University of Iowa Land Acknowledgement. It recognizes that the land we are on right now used to belong to indigenous communities. They and their ancestors had lived here for thousands of years before European and American settlers arrived. As settlers arrived, they took land away from the indigenous people. We are working to make up for the wrongs done in the past in the ways that we reach out to indigenous communities and work with them. These communities have a long and rich history and they continue to thrive in Iowa today. Please join me for a moment of reflection as I read the University of Iowa Acknowledgement of Land and Sovereignty. The University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Bahoji, Iowa, Chickapoo, Kickapoo, Ametmaneawak, Menominee, Miamia, Miami, Natuchi, Missouri, Omaha, Omaha, Wazaji, Osage, Giware, Oto, Ottawa, Ottawa, Ponca, Ponca, Potawatomi, Neshnabe, Potawatomi, Meskwaki, Nemahaki, Sakawaki, Sac and Fox, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Sioux, Sanish, Nobaka, Nueta, three affiliated tribes, and Ho Chunk, Winnebago nations. The following tribal nations Omaha, Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Ponca, Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, Sac and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Ho Chunk, Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribes and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the current Exp with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, understanding the historical and current experiences of Native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment and retention efforts, acknowledging our past, our present, and future, future Native nations. And now I'm inviting Corey Gunlock, our Curator of African Arts, to introduce tonight's program. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for, for coming tonight. Um, as Kim mentioned, my name is Corey Gunlock. I'm the Curator of African Art, and it's been my great pleasure to work with Nena Okore on this fantastic installation in the Lightwell at the Stanley Museum of Art. But first, I'd like to extend th uh, thanks, um, first and foremost, to director Lauren Lessing for giving me this opportunity to work with Nena on this commission. Um, I want to thank the members of the installation team, <coughs> namely Steve Erickson, for supporting Nena during the installation and lighting of the work. Is the mic working? Sorry, OK. Um, Sarah Luco for her registrarial wizardry throughout the project. Our communications and marketing coordinator, Mavish Farid, for getting the word out about Spirit Dance and for the program this evening. And thank you to everyone here tonight for showing up during a very uh, busy time of the academic year when a lot of people are juggling deadlines for the fall semester. Our guests this evening include Robert Rupel, assistant professor in the Department of History at the University of Iowa, uh, Dr. Rupail is a historian of modern Africa and the Indian Ocean and teaches across the fields of African, global, and environmental history. His courses range from surveys of modern African and global history to histories of race and empire in the Indian Ocean world to global environmental history and disaster studies courses. Thank you, Dr. Rupail. Where are you? Right here. There you are. Uh, for joining us tonight and for exploring the intersection of interests in identity, community, and the natural world that you share with Nena Okore, our guest of honor this evening. Okore 
is, a, uh, is the creator of spirit dance, a powerful, beautiful work of art that has become the living, breathing heart of this architect architectural space and this institution. Okori is a world-renowned artist and alumna of Iowa's MFA program, which she completed in 2005. And as of this year, she now holds a PhD in fine art from Monash University, Australia. She's involved in numerous environmental art projects and exhibitions designed to produce research, dialogue, and art making about current waste issues. Largely deriving inspiration from her natural surroundings, Okori creates works of art using biodegradable materials to engender awareness about sustainable practices in the art field. In addition, she is assistant chief examiner and associate lecturer in the art education department at Monash University and professor of art at North Park University, Chicago. All contemporary artists participating in the Threshold Exhibition Program, located here on the, the ground floor of the museum, have a connection to Iowa. As I mentioned, Okori received her MFA here in 2005. Odili Donald Odita spent time here in Iowa City while his parents were in graduate school in the 1970s. And Jia Moon, the next artist to show her work here in the lobby, received her, uh, her degree here at Iowa in 2002. A threshold is a space or point of entering or beginning. It's also a liminal space of transition. As a theme for an exhibition program here at the Stanley Museum of Art, it's however always contemporary and connected to Iowa. The contemporary relevance of Okori's work first appeared to me through her participation in Environment and Object, Recent African Art, an exhibition curated by Lisa Skidmore and John Weber at Skidmore College in 2011. Okori's artistic commitment to ecological sustainability belongs to a deeper history of eco-art around the world, and in her monumentally scaled spirit dance, which is fully exposed to the elements, we're witness to an environment and ecosystem of its own within the heart of this museum. It swings and sways and dances with the breeze through a, through a preference for, bi for biodegradable materials. Um, Sorry, I lost my place. Spirit dance evokes empathy and care for a shared environment burdened by waste and pollution. Layers of jute cloth within it refer at once to the importance of the woven material in the context of the artist's Nigerian cultural heritage and to ways in which the construction of memory and history itself is equally layered, frayed, interconnected, and ephemeral. As we embark on a new era in a new space here at the Stanley Museum of Art, I cannot think of a better artist than Nena Okore to activate the heart of this museum in a way that simultaneously calls attention to our contemporary global environment and a collection of art from Africa that is central to the identity of this institution. Thank you, Nena, for choosing to share your artistic vision with us at the Stanley Museum of Art. Please join me in welcoming our guests for this evening. Thank you, Corey, for that wonderful and warm welcome. <coughs> I'm deeply honored to be um, here this evening um, to be in your midst, and I echo uh, Corey's um, appreciation for all of you being here this evening to support um, the uh, piece that we have here uh, in the light well. So thank you so much. I'm um, especially also grateful to uh, Professor Robert uh, Raphael for um, joining us this evening in our conversation and excited to see where the conversations we have would land us as we kind of rub minds and think about ecology and spirituality and art from the African continent. Um, <coughs> I want to acknowledge the museum staff, um, the technical team and all the uh, assistants who helped to make this a reality. Um, I want to say that I received um, very strong support from them, especially with installing a piece of this, this um, nature that required so much logistical planning and um, I installation, you know, figuring out. 
and uh, Steve was very um, adept at helping with that. Um, it means so much to me to uh, be returning back to this museum, especially in this state and at this time, um, given that I was in school here 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, um, studying art and completing a graduate program. Um, it, it never uh, crossed my mind that I might be one day invited to participate in this kind of um, landmark exhibition. So I'm very, very grateful to Corey for uh, inviting me and especially grateful to uh, Laura, the director of the museum, for enabling this and granting all the permissions to, to move ahead with it. Um, thank you all for um, welcoming me back and giving me such a, a grand uh, stage to position my work. Oh, I think I was supposed to be moving the slides, I forgot. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to um, try to highlight some of the ideologies and the through lines that have been expressed through my work um, time and time again. Um, as Corey mentioned, I position myself as not just an artist, but also a teacher and an eco-art researcher um, who is interested in creating awareness through social um, material consciousness with my art. Um, I typically would draw on Afrocentric notions uh, with the idea of thinking about how all things living, non-living, and spiritual are connected and how they intersect to change things or to create experience. Uh, put differently, it means that you know, I see the art that I create as having agency and that all the materials I use are interconnected and they also uh, relate with other kinds of forces that are unknown to us, you know, spiritual forces. They, everything has a, a, a life force to it. So um, I believe that art is a, um, a material force, that art is a powerful agent for speaking about the things that affect human perspectives. And um, by experiencing art, we're also able to experience life and the different forces that make up our cosmic experience. Being part of this complex uh, web of the planetary experience and interconnectedness, people can become more embodied with their surroundings. It's on the premise of my African belief that all things are connected, that my work emerges. So when I work with materials using different kinds of fiber, fabrics, jute, stones, sticks, and paper, I'm alive to the idea that these mediums are vessels that help me to call attention to different social and ecological matters. To my mind, they are co-collaborators, they are co-actants in the process that I use for creating my art and for engendering awareness about climate change and other planetary problems. They serve as a tool for enlivening social interactions and experiences. While I am the brain behind the art that I create, I recognize and I give credit to the agencies that these materials embody and also how they invite people to engage with them through conversations in ways that I cannot. They create a, a unique kind of experience. The diverse nature of materials, plus the process and techniques of fraying the fabric, teasing the fabric, shredding, sewing, and dyeing, all enable me to connect with my materials and interweave not just the objects, the people and spaces, but also layers of history and stories and narratives that are embodied within my process and materials. To give some context to my material practice, I'd like to share some of the works that I've created over time 
and show the trajectory of these works and how they have embodied art as experience. I begin with this one called Life Force. This collaborative piece came from a residency that I completed in 2012 at the Skidmore College in New York. During the time when I was working on this piece, I collaborated with a group of um, students and um, community members, especially women uh, of different ages, racial backgrounds and ethnicities. And we painstakingly deconstructed hundreds of feet of Hessian fabric like burlap on doing the uh, woven fabric one strand at a time until the fabric was almost breaking or falling apart. Throughout the process, we engaged in dialogue, storytelling, and getting to know each other better. The experience of working together as a community was a huge part of the creative experience. It was a beautiful expression of care, of neighborliness, as we worked diligently and forged deep connections and friendships. Because the experience wasn't complete without these, these exchanges, we tried to suspend the piece at a low level so people could touch them and feel them and smell them and engage with the piece more intimately. It, it's worth mentioning that the color red was also chosen intentionally so that people can be reminded of the things that hold us together, the things that bind us, which is blood. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, being Nigerian <coughs> and also Igbo, I often draw inspiration from my Igbo culture and heritage as a way of underpinning indigenous and independent ways of thinking and looking at interdependent and reciprocal nature of human to earth relationships. In this piece, I use the Igbo title to give a nod to indigenous African philosophies that support the notion that cosmic harmony between humans, things are important for a balanced ecological world. Transcribed as destiny, this piece called Akaraka highlights the enmeshment and interconnections between humans and earthly forces, while also reminding us that humans hold a destiny to the planet in their hands. This piece is called Chance. Chance was also inspired by reflections about the complexities and interwovenness of the planetary existence. These forms are large scaled and they give a, a sense of enormity and splendor as the viewer walks below them and encounters the, the piece above eye level. And nothing gives me more pleasure than seeing people engaging viscerally with my works. On Land and Beyond is a piece that was inspired by the natural habitats and biosystems. Drawing on the experience of walking through forested canopies as a child I invited people in this piece to consider the space as an experience and walk between the suspended forms of fabric and handmade paper bowls that sat underneath. So I just want to mention that the handmade paper bowls were also um, cast from my pregnant um, torso when I, I was having babies. They're now all grown. <laughs> Um, another piece here um, titled Otu Ubochi is a towering piece that audiences have to work, um, ha have to see from above eye level. This piece pays, pays homage to the natural ecology and the, te and the temporality and fragility of life. It raises the question, how long until the planet is depleted of its grandeur and splendor? Otu Ubochi means once upon a time. In Qatar, this was an immersive installation that 
enable the viewer to engage and connect with its materiality. Created with sound and video as part of the installation, I hoped to push the materiality and spatial possibilities of this work. It was heartwarming to see people walk into the space underneath the piece. They crowded into the empty spaces inside of the piece, and other times they coalesced in with the lacy elements, creating rich visual elements, entanglements. Needless to say, the sounds of unfamiliar Igbo dialect playing in the background amplify the experience of mystery and wonder. It, rem it rem remains one of my favorite pieces to date. And this is just a, a detailed view of the piece with the projections on the floor. In contrast to the immersive installations that I, I showed earlier, I also created smaller um, pieces that could be collected. And, could be ex and these pieces basically explored shadows that were overlapping the walls and the ceiling and the floor. Body language, as the piece is titled, was one of the works that started this process for me. The interplay of light and shadow created a kind of spatial encounter for the viewer, especially when the shadow extended over the ceilings and the floor. Continuing to explore shadows, I started to complicate the pieces by adding holes into the fabric. N in the next few iterations, you'll see that. But of course, the idea behind these pieces continued to embody or be inspired by ecological and um, environmental philosophies. And this is another example that leverages and engages holes and shadows. When all is said and done is this piece that I began to think about the delicate nature of forms, trees, branches, and plant life, as well as the regenerative and metaphoric processes in life. I was also reflecting about death and decay, death and regeneration of cosmic beings, and how human experiences is no different from the animal and bio life and, animal, yeah, and plant experiences. To my mind, on the long run, we are all dying. So we can make the best of what we have while we're here, rather than kind of let things fritter away. Akachi is another piece that I created out of fiber that was centered on the natural habitat. Here I was reflecting on the way in which, and by the way, Okochi means um, Hamatan, which is like a, a very severe dry weather um, in, in parts of the sub-Saharan Africa, like West Africa. We have a band of dry season and a band of wet season. And I was thinking about you know, how um, the bio life survives under such extreme conditions and still do not really need more or much to survive. And um, for me, it was a, a, a teachable moment that perhaps we can learn to live like plants and animals in nature and use less energy and produce less waste and be content with what we have. So more of a philosophical take on this. Okilikili represents the idea of metamorphosis and the fleeting experience of life. Life will continue to fade, generate, and regenerate. However, we must support planetary health for, for it to continue. We must not allow human action to in interrupt this cycle of life. In this piece called Breed, I was trying to anthropomorphize <coughs> plant e ecology. Uh, the piece comments on mass deforestation of trees despite human dependency on vegetative life. The plants keep breeding for humanity while human-centered world continues to decapitate forests and subvert their significance. 
confluence is a variation of a piece that I showed earlier called Chance. And here I was exploring the intersections between spiritual, corporal, ecological, social relationships. I'm interested in how everything is connected through bodies, cycles, networks, strands, and fibers. Cycles and, cy and cyclones is a weather-related or weather-focused piece. It's about the changing climate and the frequent hurricanes and natural disasters. Fringes and fragments also invites audiences to interact with it. As people move through the pieces, it moves, it swivels, it dances, and it invites them to interact with it. Down to Earth considers the gravitas of the angry downpours that we, uh, we experience these days. It also draws people's attention to the materiality and tactility of the share fabric. With the piece hanging low, one could easily miss, one could easily reach out and touch it. And it was hard to miss the pulsating raw experiential energy that they possessed. Sheer Audacity was commissioned by the Memphis Bricks Museum of Art in uh, Memphis in 2017. And this was to mark its centurial milestone. At 30 feet high and about 24 wide by 24 deep, I had plenty of room to play. And so I created this piece that comprised of s several suspended and drooping elements that encourage the viewers also to walk and touch and move through the piece and look up into it. And similar to Sheer Audacity, this piece is called Ututu. It means morning and it exploded into, sorry, it explores concepts of new beginnings. In the next few slides, I show some floral pieces that serve as metaphors for the planetary journey. Working with these delicate forms, I learned how materials can inspire one to care more about the earthly resources. And like flowers, if we can remember that our time here on Earth is limited, perhaps we could be kinder to nature and leave a planet the future generation can delight in. So this piece is called Ethereal Beauty, and it's one of my sig significantly small pieces um, in the series of flower pieces that I created. It elicits more intimate connection with nature, and so people can also touch these. When I create any fiber works, I like people to touch them, to engage with them. Um, I'm not afraid of them getting damaged because that's part of the um, the network or the aspect of the work that I desire people to engage in. Here and now is another fiber piece that reflects on the passing of time and the fleeting nature of the planet. You can see how the material is kind of very sheer and almost fading and spreading out into the space. Again, I call people to be part of the process and to touch it and to engage in the shadows and really enjoy the natural quality of the piece. Ihe Dife plays with the material possibilities through expression of different textural and structural qualities. So in this piece, I was kind of creating with um, jute balls dyed and uh, added to the, to the um, work as a way to kind of deviate from the normal ways that I create the floral pieces. Likewise, on the long run, it employs different weaving processes, fraying and wrapping the jute thread in ways that uniquely offer the jute material a new personality. And resonances also explores material 
compatibility using clay and cheesecloth to expand the material meaning. Now, having shared some background into my materials and concepts and practice, it's not difficult to see where spirit dance gets its roots and conceptual bearing. Uh, and I think Corey had done a very good job of explaining the meaning behind this, <laughs> but I'll, uh, I'll try to shed more light on it. It stems from the African-inspired notion, again, that all forms, including human, non-human, and spirits possess an agentic force that is capable of doing things, cascading about three floors down into a spiral formation. The creative concept of the piece is activated through the subtle spatial movements enlivened by the swaying hanging bodies in the light well. Whether viewed from beneath, above, or between the glass windows on the staircase, the vibrantly dyed fabric, supported by thin wire structures, float and dance in space, as if responding to the silent beats of the African drum. Spirit dance not only draws attention to immaterial or material forms within the installation, such as fabrics, yarn, the wind, air, sunlight, rain, the architecture, but also it makes people aware of the experience and interconnectedness that exists between human bodies, materials, and these elemental and unknown forces within space. By using the metaphor of dancing spirits, the piece invites the viewer to be more materially, spatially, and ecologically aware and attuned to the planetary forces that dwell among us at all times. Um, again, I'm very honored to um, have been invited to be part of this um, opening uh, space. And um, I'm so delighted that this community has enjoyed the piece. And uh, I look forward to seeing how it transforms over time because, because it's open to the elements, I assume that it would change. And um, I see that it has faded slightly, but it still has retained a structure, which I'm surprised about. Um, I look forward to seeing what happens when the snow engages with the spirits and how the spirits respond to the beats of the winds in that time and uh, what may come forth from your own experiences in that time as well. So thank you all for having me and I look forward to um, speaking to you and answering questions that you may have. Thank you. So now we'll invite Nena, Corey, and Rob to come up and they'll engage in conversation and we'll invite your questions towards the end of that. Thank you so much, Nena, for that presentation and the context um, behind your, your work, Spirit Dance, here at the Stanley Museum of Art. Um, I'd like to begin with a, a question for you about um, because of your role as part of this exhibition program titled Thresholds and the importance of your relationship to Iowa, um, would you be willing to share more of your experiences in Iowa in, in terms of your training and um, the sort of formative uh, experiences that have shaped what you're doing today? And in that discussion, you've, re you've emphasized the importance of interconnection generally philosophically, materially. I want to know what your boundaries are in terms of your work, what you uh, make decisions on deliberately um, choosing not to do certain things within this recognition of the importance of, of um, interconnections. Um, so um, I'd like to start there and um, open that up to your shared interests in the environment that you have that you share with Rob. Thank you, Corey. Um, I think being um, a graduate student here or kind of going through the graduate program was quite instrumental to shaping um, 
some of the material and um, philosophical practices that I have uh, imbibed in my work until now. Um, I, I remember when I moved here in the early 2000s, uh, one of the things that struck me was um, the, the material wastes an abundance of materials that I could find at my disposal that were disposed and discarded. Um, for one, it was shocking, and second, it was great because I had lots of material to work with and <laughs> recycle in my uh, art, art making. Uh, but it helped to shape the narrative of how I was thinking about, you know, um, environment and waste. Because coming from Africa, a lot of the materials we um, saved were naturally recycled. Because we, uh, growing up, I used we used newspapers all the time to wrap our books. We use it sometimes to make table mats, you know, so we can, you know, can protect the tables um, or kind of layer into the shelves. Um, unlike here, where you have to buy those shelf protectors, we use newspapers. That was a normal thing. Um, the jute sacks that we use for grains were also used as foot mats, for instance. All the cans of food that we would buy, we always saved it and recycled them for storage or for measuring um, cups and things like that. Um, so recycling was always a part of my experience growing up. However, when I came here, the focus changed for me because I then realized that there was a waste problem. And that was when I began to really speak out about waste uh, and consumption issues. And that sort of took my work in a different tra trajectory. Um, and so I think I, I would credit Iowa for you know, giving me that um, uh, learning experience to really develop my concept in that line and in that light and uh, begin to sort of become an advocate for environment and for environmental concerns and, and, and um, um, issues. Um, in terms of the second question which you asked about, uh, to what extent do I allow um, these sort of interconnections and processes to have a, a free form to them? Um, I, I think that my philosophy has always been that because material things have an agency, I never go into the an art making process believing that I'm the sole contributor to it. I always go in with the belief that my materials and I are in conversation and other things in the space too that may be unknown to me, but I kind of am aware of it. And um, because I also grew up in, um, you know, embodying some of the uh, indigenous thinking from Igbo land, which state that, you know, an, your, art, your artistic practice kind of comes from the soul. It kind of comes from somewhere that you're not even in control of, like a spiritual um, uh, undertone. Um, whenever I'm making, I believe that there is something in me that is guiding me besides myself. Uh, and so I'm making connections. When I touch the material, the material translates something back to me that guides me to think about things. So while I do have, you know, cerebral concepts that I can put down and um, I can visualize. I leave like 70% room open to other things to factor in, in shaping or changing the way that the outcome of that work would be. Um, and so as I'm working with the material, I'm not trying to force it to do things. I'm actually listening to see what that material really wants to do. And that played out when we were creating this work because a lot of it were, we made, I made them in small units. And when we came here, we started to figure it out and really follow the, <laughs> follow the, the materials as opposed to imposing what I had in mind. I had a picture of in mind, but it didn't turn out that way because the thing, the, the space didn't want to do that and the materials didn't want to do that. So I was really echoing, um, uh, trying to listen to the, the reverberations from the materials and the space and the people that I was working with in order to, to figure it out. Um, so I think that those are some of the um, the, the processes or the ways in which I approach it in a very open-ended manner because I believe that art making should be generative and not prescriptive or, um, or sort of put in a box. And so I, I open it up and allow things to happen spontaneously um, and that is also reflected in the way that the stairwell, I mean the open 
like well is affecting the piece it is very unpredictable and things will happen along the way yep. thank you so um in response to that in the the sort of the, the agency of the materials you've discussed that in the context of african philosophy and your Igbo heritage, and in many cases you use Igbo terms to title your work. So um, I'd like to use that as a segue for my question to Rob about your own research in the environment within Africa and how issues of decolonization actually inform your approach to the environment, whereas Nena, you, you're, you're emphasizing African philosophy, which is in itself a departure from the colonial norm and and rob your your interest in decolonization and, and your awareness and understanding of the environment in an african context there's obviously a shared awareness and interest um, if you could build on that and talk about your own research in that way um well let me just let me begin by saying thank you for this invitation and thank you nana for allowing me to engage this is such a thrill for somebody outside of the art world to be part of. So I'm really, um, I, I'm really excited to be part of the conversation. Um, <clears throat> and I hope what I can do is just maybe offer some context and act as a foil maybe in some, <laughs> in some kind of way here. Um, you know, my, uh, so I could answer this question a lot of different ways. My own research is on natural disasters specifically. And I'm interested in how these sort of acute moments of catastrophe shape how people understand themselves, um, how they relate to each other, how they imagine community, how they relate to the state, these sorts of things. Um, and I work on a, the opposite side of the, of the continent. I work on the, the, the islands of the Western Indian Ocean. So basically from the Swahili coast um, east out into the ocean. But that being said, you know, I, I think what has struck me, what struck me sort of watching, uh, looking at the piece, listening to the to, to your lecture, Nana, was the centrality of African ways of knowing the natural world as a kind of guiding light um, for how you articulate your work and how you how you how you actually how you how you make it. And this is, in many ways, it strikes me as a kind of act of reclamation. The core you've you, you've spoken about here is. Um, a process that is co-constitutive with a larger political process of decolonization that's been happening really since the 1960s, 1970s onward. Um, I think one of the most pernicious processes of colonial rule, whether it be in Africa or other, or other parts of the world, was this kind of epistemic violence that sought to denude and destroy indigenous ways of knowing the world. Um, and this was a process that was done to many different ends. I think most dramatically was t towards the end of expanding and settling colonial capital. Um, and we could talk about that more perhaps later. But the consequence of this, or part of the process of this sort of epistemic violence was rendering the natural world as inert. <coughs> the taking the sort of the, the vacating it, or the attempted vacating of it, of its, uh, of its sort of insolment. Um, that did a number of different things, right? It rendered the natural world as a grid across which colonial power could expand easily, at least conceptually. It turned the natural world into a place that could be killed, destroyed, or otherwise mobilized towards very specific political ends. Um, and so, when I hear this conversation about attending to the agency of the natural world, it strikes me not just as a sort of powerful way of imagining um, the non-human, but a political act as well of really attending to deeper processes of decolonization that were not just the, um, the replacement of heads of state from Europeans to Africans, but also a really a, a deep sort of reckoning with the legacies of colonial rule. And that to me, this seems like a very, this seems like, a, it, I, guess, like I said, I see your work as part of a larger genealogy then, um, a continuation to this day of a, lo a longer process. Thank you, Rob. 
would you like yeah and i i think you you hit the nail on the head precisely because um these are some thoughts that have continued to uh, keep me um questioning you know uh, w what is the the right and the wrong about this ecological issue uh, because indigenous knowledges across the world, like you said, have been sort of eroded and displaced with Western ideologies, for me it is behooving to really position um, philosophies from places, you know, different parts of Africa and particularly from my own cultural perspective because I think that there is something there. There is there lo there's a lot of generative um, ways of approaching the problem that can constitute or can help to alleviate some of these issues. Uh, for instance, you know, help us become more embodied. Um, people, people from indigenous cultures are really attached to the earth, the land, the, the animals, the plants, and all of those things. And because of that, there was a, a, a deep uh, respect for the cosmos and for the planet. And I think with Western, you know, um, colonial experience, eroding these ways of doing things, people generally across the entire globe have become disembodied and removed from those attachments. Uh, and there's a lot of association with material things being of aesthetic value as opposed to, oh sorry, artistic materials being um, of aesthetic value as opposed to being an experience. And um, in the, in the um, pre-colonial era, art was an experience where you wear your art. You, your art was part of the, the way that you um, uh, graced your day. You, you had artifacts and the figurines that you know, were part of your existence and you recognized them as representing different kinds of entities and forces. And those things have all disappeared. You woke up acknowledging the land. You woke up acknowledging the ancestors and the spirits and all of those things. And they're all kind of like part of the cyclic experience of life. Um, and so I feel, I almost feel, you know, under pressure to, or rather obliged to say that if we can return to some of those notions of experience and existence that we might become more sensitive. We might be able to say, you know, we, we can't cut down this tree because it has life and it is important to respect it and to try to understand what it's trying to say to us or things like that, just on a very simplistic level. But I think that there is, there is so much that can be said about um, really revisiting non-Western um, ways of thinking as a method for um, or strategy for addressing some of the problems we have today because they, they, they had a purity and a, a very authentic um, approach to um, connecting with, with nature. You know, in, in response to that, I mean, I, I, I love the fact that your work demands physical interaction and it pushes the boundaries of what museums are meant to do in terms of preserving the the fragility of of an object which is also what the message is in your work and so there's this inherent tension there that that i really appreciate about your work and it's something that museums are grappling with generally in terms of what to do with things like this and so i'm excited to to have work here that that asks tough questions like this in terms of uh your engagement with with materiali materiality as history. Um, and you're both looking at material environment as a visual and um, discursive representation of history. Um, so I, I, I keep coming back to this idea of limitations because within this emphasis of interconnection, you also have limitations. And I'm interested in your use of, of of, of English and Igbo terms um, in your work, and um, is there a, a, a formula or a reason behind your decision to use either Igbo or English, depending on the space or the work? And I've also learned about your position on the significance of the origins of materials in your work, if you could talk more about that, um, in terms of connection and um, separation, whether it's important in a certain context or not. So again, the, the importance of the origins of your materials and the decision to use either Igbo or English 
for a specific work. Thank you, Corey. Um, so with regard to the material connection, um, I would say that uh, there are definitely uh, resonances in the materials that I choose to use in my work, for instance, especially with the fiber art pieces where I'm connecting to, um, I'm, I'm more attached to the historical sort of embodiment that the piece has than just it being a material that is suitable. Uh, it goes back to uh, my childhood where I did experience having uh, jit material uh, as almost like an experience in my life because it was used for everything. Uh, my parents used to buy large sacks of grain in you know f to to for for the family and we we would have it for a whole year and but every time that the grains ran out and the jute bag was left we would use the those the material for other things and it would kind of go through this process until it is completely tattered and depleted and then it would be then used maybe as a sponge or something and it, it would it would then fray and completely dis disappear but over time, I also noticed that, that the, the jute material itself also was a, a cultural material in the sense that it was, it was used in almost every sense of everyday life in the African scene, in the markets, in, you know, in the home, in the domestic spaces, everywhere you went, you would see this material and people would transfer it between themselves. And over time, uh, I remember my grandmother used to have some jute mats in her house. And at some point, my dad picked them up and would take them to our house and we would use them until, you know, maybe it transfers to some other person. So the materials are an embodiment of layered history and sort of like a, a narrative of time. And um, that material in particular stuck with me because I saw it often, I experienced it uh, quite a bit. And so it was a natural thing for me to go back to. And I, when I want to make art, I tend to draw on it because it, it is such a beautiful material and I like the, the constructive element that it has. Um, that speaks to sort of that also ephemerality that I'm very interested in, that speaks to the, the ways in which life is fragile and so uh, and yet embodying of all of these rich you know histories and narratives um so i think on that on that premise i i'm very drawn to this particular material because of all of all that it represents and the experiences that it has kind of like um the meanings or echoes or, or registers it has for me as a person and the things i've kind of experienced with it um, and then uh, kind of pivoting to the second question about uh, my choices to use either an Igbo expression or uh, an English expression. I think it has more to do with, um, I, <laughs> I think in Igbo, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, like my, my philosophy is because I grew up with a father who was r deeply philosophical and, you know, would always reference a lot of Igbo philosophies and any kind of like statement he makes, he would draw on something. And the forefathers said, and this adage, <laughs> and he would say it in Igbo. And so there were many, there were many, um, uh, th there were many resonances that he expressed or that I learned in Igbo um, that captured the essence or the real, the meaning, the philosophy behind the work was better said in Igbo than it was in English. I, there were some things I couldn't really capture in English. And so it, it's, a, it's a choice of convenience, if you will. <laughs> um, when, when I felt that I had to make a statement that was better um, embodied in the Igbo language, I would use that because I don't have any way of expressing it better in English, and English doesn't capture it the same way. Um, like that, that word um, akaraka, which is destiny, right? Destiny to me does not bear the same weight as akaraka because akaraka goes beyond just, um, you know, a, a destiny of something to a, a deeper connection to. Um, it's sort of like holding the keys, <laughs> and, and it's it's, a, it's, a, it's an interconnection thing of you know uh, human to nature to the cosmos to the spirits. There are so many things that are interconnected to make that akaraka uh, possible, as opposed to destiny. For me, feels 
really pedestrian. It feels, oh, destiny. It's your destiny. <laughs> it, it doesn't kind of carry the same weight to me. And so I would, I would say, I would suggest that, you know, because um, I have, uh, I believe that the Igbo dialect and language can interpret and capture the essence of what I'm trying to say better, sometimes I would use it. And when it feels like the English version of it works and says what I want to say in plain language, I would use that. So like chance. <laughs> oh, thank you. I want to make sure we leave time for comments, questions from our audience. How are we doing on time? Good? Okay. So again, this this overlap of practice in terms of your way, the way you approach environmental issues, I can't help but think of, Rob, your interest in cyclones um, and your interest in life cycles and patterns that you've noticed, um, cycles of thought that inform uh, your understanding of the environment or um, systems that have been put in place and, and what sort of ruptures and fraying takes place over time um, because of the way that, that Nena uses material to engage with history. I see this parallel in terms of your, um, your critical analysis of you know, colonial history in Africa and you know, engagement with, with the environment. So I'd like to ask you um, what you can say in, in, in that context of patterns and, and ruptures that complement uh, Nena's approach to her work. That's such a great question. And I, but I, I, I will answer it. <laughs> but I was just thinking, I, I, I was, you're, you're, the way you talk about history is so interesting. And I, it, I was reading an interview that you, had ma you had conducted, but seven years ago, when you, and you just rearticulated this vision of history, not as a process driven by people, but as a kind of accrual of materials or the layering of things over time. And it just struck me as, it struck me, A, as a way that a historian would answer the question, <laughs> you know, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and also, I couldn't help but think of how we find the human in layering. And I say that because I think of, and I promise I'll answer this question, but this, this answer just got, got me thinking. Um, it struck me as really kind of um, uh, profound, actually, because of the way in which the sort of the ways in which we talk about climate change today, and the way that which this category of the Anthropocene has kind of entered into the vernacular as a shorthand for climate change. Um, but at its core, the Anthropocene is a geological term. Um, it's meant to signal that humans um, have attained a kind of geological force was coined by two geologists in the 2000s. Um, and geologists read history through layers. Um, so what you described, it really struck me as a kind of very specific way of reading history. And the Anthropocene means really only that when geologists look back through time, they can see, hum they can see humanity in a way that, you know, it was the glaciers, the retreat of the glaciers, or a volcanic eruption. And then we can see the Industrial Revolution, right? We can see carbon layered into geological time. And it struck me as like, you know, your, what, how you describe history is how the Earth also thinks of history as, as deep layering. Okay, cyclones. Yeah, I mean, I think about them all the time. And... The story, I'll, let me put it this way, the story that I, you know, in the, in the research that I'm doing, the story that I thought I was going to write was in itself a cyclical story of the coming of disaster and the relentless suffering that followed. And of course, that's, that's true in many ways. But this, the story I'm ending up writing is actually the breaking of cycles, um, particularly amongst Afro-descendant Mauritians who conceive of, the, conceive of their own history as a kind of the, the, com the sort, of, like a sort of Venn diagram, sort of dynamic Venn diagram of 
ongoing catastrophes, whether it be the, the slave trade that brought who are now, now be called Creole Afro-Mauritians to the island to work on the, sli on the, the sugar plantations, or the hurricanes themselves that destroyed the villages they lived in. There was a constant sort of narrating of history Mauritian history is one of one disaster after the other, whether it's colonialism itself was a disaster. Disaster is a set of political relationships. Um, but one thing I've discovered was that in the, in the middle of the 20th century, these communities found ways to essentially read these storms as profoundly different moments. Um, I don't, don't want to get too in the weeds, but there was you know a, a storm in, the, in 1960 where um, that is it, what follows is a really a, a massive public housing development scheme that opens up home ownership and land ownership to people who didn't have it before. Um, at first glance, this read as a kind of dystopian colonial project meant to discipline, rationalize, systematize the population, an unruly population. But when I spoke to the people that lived in those estates, those housing estates, they said to me, yeah, that's the case. But this is also the first time that I could live in proximity to these people and we built community in new ways. And I had a woman tell me that, so this is you know, an interview I conducted in 20, um, 2016. She said that this cyclone saves, saved me and my family from slavery. Now slavery had been abolished in Mauritius for 130 years, right? Uh, so it was a bit incongruous to hear that, but what sh she employed this kind of idiom of that linked the the cyclonic disaster to a deeper disaster, a deeper historical disaster, but at the same time gestured to a kind of emancipation from that, and I found that really interesting. Um, so yeah, I think I've lost the thread of the question here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's a this sort of it's all connected. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's such a, an interesting um, perspective, or, or sort of like way of relating to cyclones. Um, for me, I, th I think I also have an affinity for thinking about life in as a cyclone or as, a, as cycles especially uh when i go back to you know my uh Igbo philosophy once again um we have we have a a, a phasal cyclic you know uh ideology of thinking about life in terms of birth youth adult that and reincarnation and back again and um, it, it even goes a step further for me as I relate it to, you know, the, the metaphor of the flower. I think of a flower as a cycle or a cyclone as well because it, you know, or plants as something that kind of grow and then they blossom and then they wither and then they lose their petals, which kind of goes back into the earth and then it becomes manure and it kind of comes back up again as a new life. And so... I also see that interconnection between um, life and cycles and cyclones and as sort of um, a very rich metaphor for engaging how we connect and how we relate to um, these environmental ecological issues. Yeah. Can I, I have a, a question, if I can, if I may, have a question as well about this sort of like I, I'm hearing your answer just now and your. The, the presentation as well, uh, this is a sort of jumping off your question earlier, Corey, is that I, I'm, at least I'm, I'm hearing you sort of f articulate these, your, your sort of artistic interventions through this framework of being, of, of, of Igbo and African. I, does Nigerian enter into this conversation as well? <laughs> like how does that, like I see these multiple scales and sort of methods of imagining your, I guess, interventions, if I can put it like that. Like, where does the Ni where does Nigeria sort of fit in there, or is it even meaningful? Well, it is. <laughs> it is a place of belonging. Um, I would say, I, I'm Igbo land is in Nigeria. Nigeria is in Africa. Uh, but when I think, I think when I frame things as Africa, I'm looking at sort of that overarching uh, association with. Africans, um, African culture and African indigenous 
practices in general. Um, Nigeria is such a, a, a multi-ethnic country and so it's hard for me to sort of like generalize in terms of that. I mean Africa is too but I think as a continent we can sort of we can carve it as a separate thing uh, in comparison to Western you know um, geographies for instance so I, I use it more as a uh, a way to connote the geographic difference but I cannot claim Nigerian philosophies because there are so many um, both divergent and diverse um, thinkings from that pack um, so, so it's hard it's hard to kind of like really pin down a Nigerian way of doing things so I, I, I think I, I see myself nationally as uh, a Nigerian but then when in my thinking, in my philosophy, in my practice and material uh, associations, I'm specific about Igbo because that's the, that's the ethnicity that has uh, nurtured the way that I think and the way that I frame my perspectives, my worldview, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it might be a good time to open the floor up to questions from the audience if anyone would like to ask questions, um, we can field those. Um, any questions from the audience? Question. I, I probably, as the director, shouldn't ask the first question. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. After spending some time with your piece and then sitting down in the chair and talking to one another, you know, we were just talking about what it was like to be a woman of a certain age, right? And get to a certain age. I thought it was so fascinating that you mentioned using your own body as a model for some of the forms in your work. You know, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase what you said back when you were having babies, right? I wonder what your experience of being a woman in a body that's aging has had on your practice as an artist. Lara, that is a fantastic question. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, because after, um, well, when I hit my 40s, that was about the time I had my last child. And after that time, I started to notice a lot of changes in my body. And um, it was scary. <laughs> and uh, it, it made me, it, it, it kind of made me, uh, I became alive to my mortality and my, my body and the essence of what I've been, you know, making in my art that I'm aging and that aging is leading to a place where I might become part of what my, my art is doing is like death, decay and regeneration. And so <laughs> I, think, I think it's such a, a striking question because it's something that has continued to play in my mind or on my mind as I, uh, as I think about all of these um, cycles and ideas about, you know, life um, metamorphosis. Um, I, I have come to terms with the fact that age is a beautiful thing and it needs to be embraced and it, it's coming. <laughs> On the long run, we're all dying, so it's coming. And so more and more, I'm embracing it. But initially, I was terrified by the idea that I was aging. And I, I would look to my mother, and I noticed the very um, vibrant woman that I used to look at as you know, my support system. I see her shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and I... I I reflect on it a little bit, and I, I think this is where I'm headed to, you know, and I, I, I love it, and now I'm embracing it with all of my heart and thinking it is a life process, it is a cycle, and our bodies are part of the cycle that we're kind of going through these phases, and we would get to the point where we would become manure, and then we would, <laughs> as, as morbid as it sounds, as it is true, and so, um, yeah, I think it's it's a really, I, I love that you asked that question because it has been something that has really struck a chord with me and I've been thinking about very, very much in the last 20 years. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so very much for coming. We're really enjoying your piece and we can't wait to see the winter with your piece. So w just following up on Lauren's question, 
uh, and this whole physicality, your work is so physical. And seeing the pictures of you doing your work and, um, you know, I worry like, I think, oh my goodness, does she have carpal tunnel syndrome? Like pulling apart all of these fibers for decades and the repetitive nature of what you do. And so, you know, it's, I guess it's more of a comment that in the context I see it is in the physical work that it, cr that it is necessary to create your pieces. Thank you for that observation. Um, I, for a long time, part of my artist statement was that my works were labor intensive and enduring because that's the only way that I know to make things are when they're very, very process based. And again, drawing on that experience in my childhood where everything was created from scratch. Um, <laughs> I remember a time in my childhood when I, I really hated existing because it felt like you were working all the time. You were making stuff like <laughs> in little bits and like little punishments for hours and hours, you know, peeling um, seeds or, or cutting, you know, uh, or, or plucking grains from their stock or whatever. And it, it, just, it just felt like s labor was a really huge part of how I existed. And I've, over time, of course, it grows on you and you come to love it and it becomes really entrenched in how you do things. And so all of my processes are very, very um, enduring and very labor intensive. I, I enjoy it. It's therapeutic. It's, it gives me a lot of time to contemplate and think and complicate and, you know, really push some of the meanings of what I'm doing. And so I, I and also engage with the materials that I'm working with. So it is, it is a huge part of how I make. And obviously, it's hard to tell your body with, with this age. <laughs> I find myself, you know, finding it more difficult for which reason I do now have assistants helping me. But it, it is, yeah, very um, tasking, I would say. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm really fascinated by by the slides that you've seen uh, shown. I haven't seen those before, um, and you know I'm fascinated by two things. Uh, they're really similar: the, the light and the shadow. You know, your your the, uh, the works that you've shown are are very uh, transparent, basically. Uh, so the light light goes through them. The, the shadow is to me you know, a big part of what you see. And so one question I have is, you know, do you know, how does, how do you think about the shadow of it? Because it's unavoidable. And then also, what about the light? You know, uh, these are from an installation where it looks like it's fixed light, but, you know, with, it looks like they're so natural that you might want to have a, a daylight which changes throughout the day. So how do you think about the shadow and the light in terms of, of the kind of art that you do? Thank you. I, I, I agree with you that, you know, the shadows are not controlled, really. I think they just form based on the kind of lighting it is, whether it's artificial or daytime lighting. But I've been fortunate, I would say, that a lot of times when I've shown work in this capacity, th there's been a lot of daylight in the space based on maybe the architecture, the windows, and things like that. So um, it has enabled the piece really uh, transform over the course of the day and the weeks and the months or whatever that they've been installed, but um, that has been a, a huge um, advantage. But I think that this, the the wo the pieces that live in galleries or live on white walls tend to be more controlled lighting, where I can, you know, endorse the light and control it the way that I want to cast the shadows in certain ways. But I I'm definitely with you when it comes to um, leaning towards having daylight participate in that because I think it like the, the piece out there I think it changes throughout the day and it casts shadows in such 
enigmatic and unpredictable ways that I think really charge the experience uh, of people that view that space. So I, I'm, I lean towards that a lot, but you can't always get that <laughs> in, in, your, in the process. So I, whenever I can get it, I take it. But yeah, definitely, I think um, that it's something that also I consider a lot when I'm making work, um, thinking about how the lighting can influence uh, the work either as a fixed um, experience or um, something that changes with the day and the, the night times. Yeah, but I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story. I, I remember once I had shown um, some fiber works in a gallery that had really beautiful dramatic lighting uh, and uh, a woman came into that space and viewed a few of the pieces and came to me in tears and she said i never experienced work that has moved me like this where the work felt like it 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 was reaching out to me and i couldn't i didn't understand what she was saying but she was so moved by the, she said that the, the work and the work couldn't she couldn't separate the work from the shadows and that really struck her in a way that you know touched her I uh, moved her to tears, and I, I was also moved <laughs> by that. But I, I think that you're, you know, definitely it's a, it's a, a great observation. The shadows are, are have a lot of potential and and uh, agent agentic force, so life force uh, that I'm talking about here. Yeah. If I Thank can, you. I uh, this made me this this answer and this question made me think as well in the context of climate change, which sort of is overarching here. The politics of light and darkness, of sun and shade and of heat and coolness and who has access to shade it seems like a very political question as well that like seeking shade shade is a human right in a, in a global in a heating planet as well yeah for what it's worth yeah. I want to thank you for uh, making this piece and having it in this museum. I've been enjoying it so much, especially the, the way the wind moves it. You know, one day you'll look at it and it's just peaceful, and the next day it's like whirling around. And uh, I've noticed everyone who comes into the museum really enjoys it, so thank you. Thank you. But um, my question is, um, we traveled to Mexico um, years ago, like in 1980, and in those days, everyone shopped at the market with a shopping bag made out of natural fibers, jute, usually dyed, but colorful, beautiful. Uh, at some point shortly thereafter, it moved to plastic bags, and they're very abundant you know, in, in Mexico and Latin America and probably all over the world at this point. <laughs> and when you're dealing with that in your everyday life with plastics, it's pretty hard to, use, to keep using it. You know, you have to either use it until it falls apart, which it doesn't like to do. <laughs> um, I'm thinking there's, there's many things about our lives today that uh, prevent us from being at one with nature as you describe. And I'm wondering what you think about plastic in particular and you know, dealing with those sorts of things in people's ordinary life. <laughs> oh, I, I, I agree. Plastic is such a nuisance, but so um, ubiquitous. Um, in the, it, it's everywhere and so much so that now it's it's uh, scientists have, have uh, advised that we we even carry them in our bodies as microplastics, right? The the aquatic life are also consuming uh, the plastics, and so it's as, it's as if we cannot separate ourselves from it until capitalism is ready to separate us from it, and it probably would not happen, <laughs> except something you know heavenly comes and, and, and disturbs it. But I, I agree that it is something that needs to be, uh, it's unsettling and uh, it, it is a question. That's why I, I keep saying that, that if we can become more aware and more sensitive to the agencies of what we use, we might be a little bit more kinder, you know, we might be kind or kinder to our uh, environment because 
if we um, knew that the plastic material had negative implications and you know harmful implications, especially as we're using them, we might make a conscious effort to scale back. And you're right that if you're using jute, it probably would not last as long. But you know, at least we know that it would not be as harmful. Uh, but I think I think when I talk to many people those thought processes are not really at the fore at the fore of their minds it's kind of somewhere at the back somewhere far away it's like oh yeah plastic problem we have it but you know, so what <laughs> uh, next you know kind of thing and i think that we really need to bring it to the fore and we need to keep talking about it and creating awarenesses and co you know consciousness about it so that it, we can start to make individual efforts to scale back on our use of those materials so that I think if we collectively each could do something small to make a difference in how we're using these materials, those would become larger collective efforts that would change the dial a little bit. And so I continue to <laughs> encourage and you know persuade and talk about these things and uh, find ways to let people realize that this has agency so that as you're doing away with it or deciding oh you know what i'm so sick and tired of this red couch i'm gonna go buy another one remember that it has agency and it could be doing harm somewhere else or it could be causing the ad more problems so perhaps hold on to it a little longer and see if you can make the best use of it rather than go spend money and keep supporting the capitalist culture that is destroying the earth and so it's it's a very convoluted and disturbing um circumstance but i think that again education, uh, you know, conversation, dialogues can help us, you know, break away from the mode and hopefully become a lot more um, astute about, you know, <laughs> about stay staring away from these things that, you know, are harmful and be more thoughtful in our actions in little ways. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we had to wrap this up. Um, I'd like to bring it back to spirit dance. So this is an artwork that its entire life cycle will happen in the light well from kind of the creation to maturation, decay, and eventual end. Have you had any other works that complete the life cycle in that way? And have you thought about how you might want to mark its end um, or its transition into a new phase? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, yes, two, two things. One, um, a work like this I think of as eventually kind of deteriorating to the point where maybe it would just be the wires hanging. <laughs> and for that reason, I might recycle those wires and use them again in some capacity because I don't want them to be discarded. So that's a way that I'm thinking this would end. But uh, in terms of uh, other materials that I've worked with that have deteriorated completely, I, I create bioplastic material, which is like made out of food waste. And those materials, I've been actually um, making artworks that I've been putting outdoors that completely deteriorate. They're eaten by insects, they're eaten by birds, they're, they fall apart and they fall to the soil and become, you know, they rot away. And so th there's that as well as an example of how I've been making conscious effort to move away from the more synthetic, you know, uh, materials to uh, less uh, durable, you know, <laughs> sustainable <laughs> materials. So yes, I, I, I have been making an active effort to create art that we, we don't just waste in the end, but we delight in by putting it outdoors and it can become part of the ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Nana, Rob, and Corey for the conversation tonight. And thank you, everyone, for coming out.